Hello, this is Arki, and guess what? I had a chance to sit down with Christian Sundberg and Melissa Denise and have a chat. So what we all three have in common is that we have we have pre-birth memories. And um, they are available um, on YouTube if you want to Google and on Melissa's channel. And I will leave them in the description below, the link to them. But yeah, we had a chance to sit down and talk and we will be answering six questions which we get asked a lot and we'll be sharing our perception on them. Please keep that in mind and yes, if you have any more questions, you can leave them in the comments. I will try to answer more and make more videos on them. Please be respectful and love each other and yeah, hope you enjoy it. There will be three parts, part one, part two and part three. Bye bye. Question number one is, how do we know we aren't being tricked into coming here over and over? And I get this question a lot because there are some pretty prominent voices on YouTube who are saying that we're caught in and stuck in an earth prison and reincarnation cycle here against our will. So we're going to talk about that. How do we know that we aren't actually being tricked into coming here over and over and that we do have free will? Do you guys just want, do you want to like have an order of how we answer it or you just want to jump in? However you feel, Melissa, you could start and we can go around or just okay, jump yeah, in. Yeah, be yeah, organic. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so I'll start. So my experience of the other side from my pre-birth memories and my out-of-body experience that I had when I was 18 is that um, it is not very easy to see. Like truth is pretty self-evident on the other side. And I'm not going to say that it's impossible for there to be a deception because I don't think my experiences are encompassing enough to say that, but what I can say is based on my own personal experience and specifically in interacting with my guides or angels or whatever name you have for those beings, the ones that specifically help you to plan your life and guide you through this life, the, the truth of who they are is very self-evident because when you're on the other side, you don't have physical barriers to hide things behind. You don't have mental barriers. Um, when you interact with another spirit being, you go way beyond being able to simply read their thoughts. Um, you can become one with them to the point where you feel that you are them and you've experienced everything that they have from their point of view. It, it's really impossible for there to be a deception in a scenario like that, because if they were saying something that was untrue, which I think would be impossible to begin with, you would immediately know it. And so I can, speaking for myself and my specific experience with these, what I would call my angels or my guides, um, I, I, the knowledge that I had of them is deeper than you would have of your, your children, your parents, your your intimate partner, it's like you are a part of them and you are all a part of this magnificent um, song of creation of everything that is. And it's just perfect knowledge, it's perfect communication, and it's perfect trust. And so, and also specifically for me, I remember planning my life. I was in no way tricked into coming here. I can't necessarily speak for anybody besides myself, but I did plan it. I was very excited about it. And I chose all of the major life events that were going to happen. So that's my take on that question. Arke, do you want to go next? Oh, oh sure. sure. Well, I have thought about this question and I have never been asked this, but I've seen this circling around the internet and I did ask like the guides when I met them. I asked like a bunch of questions, but then when I tried to recall them consciously, it was very abstract all over the place because I tried to wrap words around them. And 
also the human mind filters everything. So I was trying to understand what I received and what they were trying to say, what I felt. But what I can see, I mean, what I can start off with for this question, being tricked itself, it comes from the human mindset, human experience, and um, from the ego itself. So looking at the word trick, it is manipulated, lied, controlled. And if we look at it, we learned about all of this on earth, each one of us at least once in their life, they have experienced that or they did that to somebody. And I think this person is implying that it is the, all of these actions are still applicable on the other side, that they still exist on the other side. However, from what I've experienced, our core was pure consciousness and it was just pure love, unconditional love, no judgment at all. And at that pure consciousness, we are so magnificent, so powerful, so transparent that we are just one. And we feel each other. We don't need words. So you feel the tree, you feel the other soul, you feel everything before they say anything, before they direct the message, they, before they form the message. And at that level of transparency, you, you, you just feel the other soul and what they're saying, what they're trying to say, their concerns, their feelings, their intentions, their pure love, that the tricking, manipulating, controlling doesn't exist there because it is what comes from ego and what's out there is just the pure love and love is not controlling, love is freeing and love is forgiving and love is compassionate. And love is accepting, love is understanding, love is patience, love is trust. And that's what we are. So I don't, at least from my own experience, I know that I wasn't tricked. And I don't think, I don't believe that we can be tricked because we are the universe experiencing ourselves through this physical human experiences. We are trying to expand our consciousness and I don't think we trick ourselves to come here. And by this question, what I'm imagining is this person has this mindset of that there is someone who is much more powerful than you, that's much more stronger than you, who can trick you to come here. Let's say that's the case. If that being that is more stronger and much more powerful than you did trick you to come here, which is the result, why didn't that being take your free will of questioning things? Even asking this question is a proof that you have the free will to question. And if that being is that powerful or God or whoever you want to call it, they would have taken that away from you. Why would they go all the way through the tricking and you coming here, you know, asking that question? That's the question I I have in my mind. Like, why why would it why would that be that way? So I don't believe that you can be tricked because even the the question that you are asking here is the proof that you have the free will to ask questions and question everything, and that is the evidence of that you have love, which is love is the freeing. Love is freedom. Freedom means you have the free will to do whatever you want, to ask questions, to be whoever you want, to have any experience you want. Even if it's this question itself, which is a funny question for me. <laughs> and I did have this, because I, I, I used to astral travel a lot and get out of my body a lot. And I've met beings and I used to ask them like, I used to get scared a lot at first, but then I used to, I did ask once, why would they scare me in the past? Because I would see them in my room, in the corner, or working on my body, or saying things like questioning or asking me things, and I would be frightened. So I used to ask them, why was that happening? Why were you scaring me? And then they explained that, it wasn't them 
scaring me, but it was me, myself, and my state of being. The fearful state of being blinds you completely, that you don't perceive anything or anybody in front of you for who they are, but you filter them from your perception. For those who have, who say that they have been tricked, I don't know. It's coming from their experience. I wouldn't judge and I wouldn't say that they're right or wrong because I don't know. I can't tell. What if there is a purpose behind of that mindset, behind of that perception they have? What if for, you know, the reason they remember it because they thought they have been tricked? What if it was the only solution for them to keep that memory of the afterlife? Or for them to become more conscious in this human life? What if that is the case? And I would I would always leave an open-ended questions and see, you know, try to expand and you know zoom out the um, questions and see from each perspective rather than jump to the conclusion like, oh yes, this person was tricked, this person was not tricked. So yeah, I can't tell that. But for myself, I wasn't tricked. I, for sure, I wasn't tricked. And although I have gone through challenges in life, I am very, very happy I have gone through them because of the moment now I am experiencing and I understood the lessons in each of the challenges I had. So, and I, I just hope that those people who think they've been tricked, they can enjoy without being attached to that word of being tricked and manipulated and controlled to come here and fully enjoy the human experience while they're here because what else you can do? Yeah, that's all for me, um, Christian. Yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. So I definitely agree with both of you from my experience. And again, I, I agree. I can also only speak from my own experience. Deception is something we learn on earth while we are in the non-native experience of separation. So here we're in a place where we don't communicate in a pure way. We don't have that full telepathic access that is natural to us. In other states of being, it's natural to have that full telepathy and to have, I like the word transparency that RK used. We have that full transparency and it is the most natural thing. And in that transparency, there is full knowing. And full knowing is totally self-evident when you are there. So the exchange with others is... Um, it, they're a part of you and you're a part of them and you feel it and you know it. And so the exchange, it, you, if there was deception, it, well, there couldn't be deception. I mean, but if there was even an attempt, you would know it because the intent would be seen and the thought would be seen. Now, in my case, I, I also chose this life intentionally. And I also feel very confident I was not tricked. I had full knowledge of what I was doing and what I was choosing and why and all the details of the life that I was reviewing and why. And I had full connection with my guides and they understood me very deeply. And it was all up to me. And it was, it was all done from a vantage point that was much higher than the human personality's vantage point. And also very importantly, I think it's, I think it's really important to add that I knew that my choice to incarnate, my choice to surrender to the veil, as we call it, had to be intentional. And it had to be intentional because the soul is a part of the whole. It's a part of source. It's, it's sovereign unto itself. So the only way that it can be bound, we're not actually bound, <laughs> just feels <laughs> like we are. The only way that we can be bound is to surrender ourselves into the binding. There is no greater power than the sovereignty of the soul because it's what is. It's, it's the thing that is. It's the substance of, of beingness, of creation itself. And so from that vantage point, it sees all and knows all and it and it makes the choice completely voluntarily and and i i believe that's why in my pre-birth experience both times that i recall surrendering to a veil in a physical life my surrender my free will allowing was absolutely necessary and that choice was done from a place of total seeing and knowing 
But then once we're here and once we're wrapped in the experience of the human condition and all the limitations, we learn many things. We learn how to experience the world in a state of a non-native state of separation. <laughs> and in this non-native state of separation, we don't experience each other's thoughts commonly. We don't feel each other's feelings commonly. I mean, we still do on some level, but it's not like a routine common moment to moment thing. And so we think that like our thoughts are private, our internal experience is private. And, you know, and then we can't even feel that the people outside of us are even a part of us anymore. So deception is just part of what has arisen from you know our, our choice making here in this context but then once we're here because we have no memory of the higher context we assume that things that are true here must be true in the higher systems we see we try to look up and out you could say <laughs> we try to impose what we learned on earth onto the rest of the picture <laughs> But we, but we can't do that because this is the non-fundamental state of being. It's, it's metaphorically like if you logged into a video game and then thought you were the video game character and tried to understand all of reality from the perspective of the video game character, it wouldn't really make sense because that character is under non-native limitations. That's how it is being human. We're under a non, non-native status, uh, set of limitations. And then because it's all we remember, we assume that all of reality is, um, you know, captured by those limitations and it's not even things like linear time and discrete location. You know, these things that seem super obvious to us are not fundamental limitations. They're not real. So deception is one of those things we learn on earth. And because of our fear, we then were afraid of it. And so then we're afraid, well, maybe this is how it is in the big picture. We tend to believe about our reality and then whatever we believe about it we put that interpretation upon it our, upon our physical reality and then we assume that the larger context is just kind of like the physical reality but maybe bigger and we want to impose that same understanding on it but that can't truly be done you know in the higher states of being there is and i love the word that arky used there's this beautiful transparency between us all it is the natural state of being because we are all connected. We're all one. And my goodness, I miss it. <laughs> Melissa and I were talking about this before we started recording tonight, how it's just so alien on earth to not feel that in a full conscious way all the time. But anyway, in higher systems, feeling that connectedness and that transparency is the natural state. And in that state, Everything that the other being is experiencing, feeling, thinking is totally known and seen. And it's, and it's seen for what it is and it's okay that it is what it is. And in that atmosphere and in that, in that context, there, in my experience, at least, there is no room for deception because everything is plainly seen out on the table and everything is felt. So I feel confident, at least for myself, again, I, I agree, I can't speak for anybody else's experience, but I feel confident that deception is not possible that's a locally learned earth earth-based assumption and uh, from that state of being it's it, it's self-evident what is and i do not feel it's possible to be deceived into um, into a physical incarnation thank you so much both of you 100 percent agree with everything that you said uh, something else came to me while you guys were talking that i thought i might just add um, because we're all like in agreement that deception is impossible on the other side um, or whatever we want to call it. But then I get a lot of comments from people who tell me things like, well, I remember I did not want to come here and my guides grabbed me and, and pu pushed me in and told me you have to do this. You signed up for it or something like that. And one thought that I have about that is that um, I've read a lot of my, well, I've read my, both of Michael Newton's books and some of Dolores Cannon's books, and they're both um, between life regressionists. And what we all have a memory of to some extent, or I know Christian, you do is planning your life. And then I think what might happen is as you're getting to that point where it's time for you to go, and this comes out in the books a lot, uh, Michael Newton's books specifically, that it is kind of like an okay you have to go now it's time yep. and at that point once you're going in you are starting to go under the veil and you're not remembering things as clearly but the life has already been set up and if you don't go it's not like you know it's going to be 
horrible, you're going to mess up the big plan or something, but there could be ramifications for people that you've made agreements with. So that's one explanation for maybe why people are remembering that message right before they go in. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll make a quick comment to that. So I feel that the, okay, this is super hard to talk about. I feel that the human personality portion of the self is formed prior to the physical experience. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the veiling. And so once there is a subset of the self, I call it the personality portion of the self, that personality experiences reality from its own perspective and may be nudged <laughs> to continue down the path that the higher self has signed up for, for that portion of itself. And now that makes it sound like two different selves and it's really just one self. <laughs> But, um, but like, for instance, you know, here as the human personality, when people have near death experiences, sometimes they'll begin to go back and a guide will say, Oh, wait, no, <laughs> it's not time yet. It, I, it's, I don't feel it's that dissimilar because the personality portion of the self doesn't have full visibility. It may not even remember what, what it has agreed to participate in. In a sense, every day that we get up in the morning <laughs> and go about our day and eat our breakfast, we are that unconscious, you know, uh, we, we've signed up to play this role and have this perspective. And every day that we do that from this veiled perspective is a part of that original commitment. So whether that commitment is expressed here in a physical way or in certain non-physical experiences, I don't see a huge difference because I, I feel that the physical it, and non-physical experiences, they, there doesn't need to be a huge distinction between them. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes the personality needs a nudge <laughs> and we get those. Thank you, Christian. Are we ready to move on to question two? Does Ar RK, did you have something to share? No, no, yeah. Okay. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to rush you. All right, so question two is, why do we have to come here to learn about love if we are already loving by nature? And I think this is the most common question that I get asked. So this is a question that's very, very hard to answer and articulate into language because we are looking at things from a very, very limited perspective here and our language is even more limited. But the best way that I could answer that is to say that on one level, I do think it is true that we are here to learn about love. And I know that many near-death experiencers are told this, life is, a, life is the school of learning how to love. And it just makes it really simple and easy for us to understand on this level. But I think maybe it's more of like a a grade school way of describing what's happening and maybe more like a, a college graduate way of trying to explain it would be less that we have come here because we need to learn about love and more that we want to be part of the expansion and unfoldment of love. Mm -hmm. So here we are within time and we're looking at things as a progression of events we're experiencing the evolution of our souls, so to speak. But in reality, um, outside of time where we exist as spiritual beings, there is no progression of events. There is nothing to learn. There is, um, we don't need to grow and develop. We are already perfect. But, and this is a part that's really hard to describe. The universe is perfect because it is becoming perfection and it is experiencing that becoming and that evolution into the perfection that it already is and mm -hmm. it's um, the eternal unfoldment of now or the eternal evolution and unfoldment of love and we come here to experience that and to be a part of that mm -hmm. so in some way when we project our consciousness into this world of contrast where we can experience something that is the opposite of love and we can um, still be what we are, we are strengthening love or expanding love. Even though love is already perfect, it is perfect because it is evolving into perfection. 
And that doesn't make sense to our human minds, but that's the best way that I can describe it. I love that was it. beautiful. RK. Yeah, I love it. I actually thought about this question and I, I, I honestly it was like stuck with it and I was like, how do I explain that feeling? How do I explain everything that was downloaded, but in, in the form of feeling, in a form of knowing into mm. words? Mm. And I think it is far more complex than we can think or imagine um, from, the, from the human mind uh, we are right now at. But when I, and I'm speaking from my own experience, when I had my out-of-body experiences, I didn't feel like there was something on earth we were learning and taking to afterlife. Like there was nothing that I was taking to afterlife. And the love and the, this question is completely logical because I understand why would someone, you know, would ask this and I would ask the same thing. Because I, I felt like I was this pure love. I was the entire universe. Entire universe was within me, and I was connected to everybody and everything. So I thought, well, why, why did I go to Earth? But then I had this unconditional love to Earth, and I felt this responsibility that I have to go back. Mm. And then I started questioning here on earth and researching consciously already asking myself, okay, so I am this love and it's at my core. So what am I doing here? And I think we aren't actually learning about love, but we are remembering about our love and what we are and also having this experiences where we have the separation where we have the physical form the sensations these physical sensations and in individual characteristics to each other which we don't have on the other side we, we are completely one and here we are separate we have separate thoughts we have separate um talents hobbies interests uh -huh. and things like that and i think that's beautiful and i was thinking like okay then the 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 message I was given was the purpose of your life is love. And I was thinking, but I already love everybody and everything. But then I was still loving from the mind. Mm. There is this mind love, mind filtered love, which is, there was this story. I, I watched this video. I forgot the, the name of the author, but he was asked, he was a fisher. So he was asked, do you love fish? And why do you love fish? And he goes, oh, fish tastes yummy. And it's, it tastes good. It fills me up. And then, but is that true love? <laughs> and then the, to that fisherman, it was, the question was, isn't that fish love? Because you don't love the fish itself. It's freedom and it's the fish for who it, it is. But you love the taste of it, the pleasure it gives you. And that was the ego filtered love. But the pure love we have is the freedom that we give to that fish for being itself, for swimming, for being the colorful, for being a mess, um, pooping, everything. So you, you love that fish entirely, unconditionally. No agenda, nothing wrapped around, completely. And I think we slowly, slowly, by our human experiences, by our challenges, by our ego guiding us, we learn slowly about that. We slowly learn to love everything about ourselves, every suffering we had, every failure we had, every doubt we had. Slowly transcending it all with unconditional love because that's what we end up with at the end. And I think the divine purpose is remembering the love despite of how much we have forgotten about who we truly are. And by expanding our experiences and by creating something new and expanding the universe by, 
you know, each one of us having different experiences, different worlds. You have the different view, you had different experiences, I had different challenges, and it's expanding the whole universe because we are the universe. And we, through those experiences, we apply that unconditional love to it. So at the end, would I say that we learn about love coming here? I would say we remember our love and we we learn to apply that love to everything and we go beyond that separation. We don't separate the good and bad, dark and white, and joy and pain. We just love everything unconditionally because it was never separate it was always one i wouldn't say we come to learn about love but remember about love and ourselves and also expand the universe expand ourselves and who we are by creating our worlds our experiences so that's what i would say so i wouldn't like specifically use the word i'm learning about love because I don't know. I think I'm remembering about love because if you take all the layers off of all the beliefs and religions, everything that was applied, I am left with nothing but love to like, I would be left with love. That's what, what I would be left with. I, it's, it's so hard to explain in words. Anyways. I hope I hope that made sense because it makes so much sense in my head. And I, I watched this video of Dolores Cannon and she says, we come here to learn about energy and manipulate energy. And I thought about it. How do we learn to manipulate energy? You know, it's easy to go through the life and go through experiences when you are centered when you are present when you are loving and you know you have that trust in yourself you have that trust in the universe because you are the universe and you know it's happening for you you learn about your love and then the outside world starts mirroring that love thank you rk that's beautiful i really resonate with that so yeah, language is ridiculously limiting and difficult in this context. So I'll just give it a shot, but I, I agree it's butchering it no matter what words we use. Okay, so the true substance of our being is love. And it doesn't need anything. Need is another human learned idea. Spirit itself, beingness itself is and it is totally free and full. It's, it, it is all life. It's full of all life. It has no need. So you could say love is what is like a describer of the substance of beingness. It, des it, it describes life itself. It describes what we are. So then why come to, you know, quote, learn love? Learn, learn I agree, learn is a, is a really difficult word and perhaps not the, not the right word. But we only have so many words. And the learning we do is not intellectual it's not behavioral even it is experiential it is a growth of the being with a capital b by being with a lowercase b so so the what i mean is the spirit that we are the consciousness that we are the fullness that we are expands what it is and it is made of love okay so it's an expansion of love through the process of being something specific and the deeper the context so so like the human experience is an extremely limiting context very very vibrationally distant by comparison state of being and because the the, the distance is so great the opportunity is so great because the further we can go out in that vibrational distance, if we can meet this experience with love and integrate this experience, integrate means fully process, fully come to terms with, fully meet our fears, fully experience everything and, and accept everything. And, and you know, as we do that, we shine what we already are, that love and that joy and that freedom, because that is our true nature. 
And if, as we can shine that into the world, even in very, very small ways, like I'm not talking, you got to move all these mountains. I'm saying like the beauty of any common moment as we bring love and joy and peace into it. If we can do that here, there's this beautiful, oh my gosh, there's no words for this expansion of the body of life or the body of being itself grows and expands to that place. So you might think of it like contrast is a, is a creative tool that consciousness uses to expand its already loving nature. We are creative beings, so we choose to experience this and we choose to exercise our creativity even in a context of great limitation like this one. Even when things can be really difficult and crazy and even when we're like goodness we don't remember we're unconditionally loved can you imagine like here we are <laughs> and while we don't remember we're unconditionally loved from here we're making choices you see it's 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 a it's an incredible context through which to expand and integrate experience so that the true nature of our loving being can more fully grow and express so I guess that's I guess that's the only way I can possibly try to put it in a succinct <laughs> in a succinct, succinct way. It, it, it like love is already what we are. We can't lose it. We don't need to do anything. But love and joy are their own reward. Love and joy are beautiful and awesome. So we choose to expand love and joy. We're curious enough and creative enough and powerful enough that we choose to even come and have an experience of incredible limitation for the expansion of love and joy watch the video until the end thank you very much um please check out melissa's channel and christian sandberg's uh, book and uh, yes leave your questions below if you have more and we can have a discussion and always be respectful and love each other and stay safe bye bye take care